Greetings, everyone. My name is David McLeod, and I am your Life Mastery Coach and best-selling lead author of this brand new book, Gifts of Wisdom, Practices for Healing and Empowerment, which is now available on Amazon, and you can find out at the link below here on this screen. Welcome to my chapter reading sessions for this book in which you get to meet each author and listen in during a personal reading of that person's entire chapter from this book. Today, my guest is Sarah Jane, wise contributor of chapter four. Sarah is the creator of Vocal Reiki, a sound-based modality that helps people to connect with and heal their inner child. She also is the founder and host of Gift of Healing TV that shares healing techniques and practices to support health and well-being on all levels. Hello there, Sarah. Thank you so much for being here. It's great to be with you today. Hi, David. Great to be here. And sort of thank you for actually inviting me to be a part of this. Well, you know, you are most welcome. And in fact, I was going to ask you a little bit about that because, you know, I did invite quite a few people, um, many of whom I, I knew quite well and some maybe I didn't know quite as well. Uh, I've known you for a long time, I think since around 2011, I believe we met or maybe even before that. I can't remember for sure. But yeah, um, so you decided you checked in with yourself and you decided, yeah, I'm going to say yes to this. So what was it that inspired you to say yes to this project and to bring yourself fully into writing a chapter? This goes back to your original title for the book which was Elder Wisdom. And that really hit me, bearing in mind that this year I've hit 66 and I now get my pension. Um, <laughs> so, and I think that totally entitles me to class myself as an elder. I, of course. But, but also, um, my life story, I know there is so much wisdom I have gained from opening up to the experiences that I've had in my life and my life has changed so much um, and obviously my story is going to explain some of where I was and uh, and the fact that these days with the sound with I work with I don't care where I am who's around me if I feel it's required I'm quite happy to do it <laughs> I don't worry about what other people think about me it, it is what it is um, and I think if I can help people to build their confidence in themselves, to be true to who they are, that's what's important to me. And every opportunity that we get to share our wisdom, our knowledge, our experiences that have supported us, because I feel it's very important that we share what has worked for us. Um, not what we think other people want to hear. And if it resonates, great. If it doesn't, there's something else that is right out there for them. It's just a matter of opening up to it. Yeah, you know, I love what you're just saying here. It, it, it's it been a common theme I've noticed in this book, pretty much every chapter of this book, where ultimately the bottom line boils down to knowing the truth of who you really are and showing up that way instead of you know putting on the masks and the costumes in order to pretend to be a certain way that you imagine other people want to see in the world i think that that idea of authenticity is is really really important oh 100 percent you know sort of um you and i were in the same sort of um workshop in um was it boulder in colorado back in 2013 and i remember asking the question do we really have to wear makeup and i was told yes and i thought no i don't if people can't accept me for who and how i am then if whether i'm wearing makeup or not is wh whether they will listen to me then right. they're not they're not people that i'm they're meant to what I am sharing is considerably more important than wearing makeup, wearing gold, whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yes, mm -hmm. it's sensible presentation. It's not coming in in ripped jeans and whatever. But I don't have to go out and have the coiffure and everything else because this is me. Right. Yeah, absolutely. 
Well, you know, Sarah, I think I'd like to just dive right in and have you read your chapter. So folks, friends, people who are watching the recording here, please just give your full attention to Sarah Jane as she reads chapter four, finding yourself after trauma, understanding your experiences, embracing their gifts. As traumatized children, we always dreamed someone would come and save us. We never dreamed it would, in fact, be ourselves as adults. Alice Little. We should never judge what can be traumatic to a child. A single word, a tone of voice, or an action that can bring their world tumbling down around them. Children aren't as resilient as adults seem to think. They don't understand or know how to deal with mental and emotional pain so much that they bury their feelings deep within them. They may have no memory of what happened or how they felt, but it all still lies at a deep cellular memory level. My story. In early 1959, Jane was sitting on the kitchen floor, curiously watching her mother. What is she doing? There was a table with a cloth on it. Her mother was making a cup of coffee with boiling milk, put it on the table and stepped away. Shuffling across the floor, Jane pulled the edge of the cloth. A splash, a scream, a crash, as the cup of coffee went over her face, down her neck, and seeped into the jumper she wore. Having had nursing training, her mother grabbed her and ran her under the cold tap before running across the road to the doctor's surgery for an ambulance to be called. In the late 1950s, most homes didn't have phones and even fewer had two cars. The jumper Jane was wearing stuck to her skin and she wouldn't leave the resulting wounds alone. Jane was in the hospital for three months and crucified, the term used by the hospital for pinning her arms so she couldn't scratch the affected area. The hospital's rules were that her parents could only visit her every other day for an hour. However, due to the distance they lived from the hospital, they were only able to see her once a week for an hour. Why don't mummy and daddy come to see me? What have I done wrong? Don't they love me anymore? There were so many tears and feelings she couldn't understand or name, running rife through her tiny being. Confusion, feeling lost, so very unhappy. All she wanted was to be hugged and cuddled, to feel loved and cared for, and for the pain and hurt to go away. It didn't matter how many loving, soothing, calming words her mother spoke to her. She still left without taking Jane with her. As the weeks rolled on, she calmed, resigning herself to these strange feelings. Then one day her parents came and took her home. Only this wasn't a home she recognized. It was strange and unfamiliar, except for my teddy bear, a familiar friend at last. Life ticked on and in August, her sister Gillian was born. Sadly, an unwell baby who spent time in and out of hospital. When she was nine weeks old, Gillian died in her sleep at home in her cot. As her mother was packing Gillian's things in a cupboard, Jane asked, baby in cupboard? Jane was only 18 months old and loved unconditionally. First her parents and then Gillian. She was gone. I've been left again. No one loves me. Yes, this is my story, the start of it. I was less than a year old and spent my first birthday in hospital. I have no memories of what happened. 
only what I've been told over the years, and an educated guess as to how this precious little girl must have felt. In the years that followed, other things compounded my feelings of insecurity, setting the scene for the next 30 plus years. Thank goodness for my teddy bear. He never let me down. I was painfully shy, becoming a people pleaser. I always said yes, and constantly tried to figure out what others would like so they would be happy and with the hope that they'd like me, even if it was only for a short while until they realized I wasn't worth liking or loving. I went into automatic mode. I existed, doing what had to be done, saying what I thought I should say, behaving in ways that hopefully kept other people happy. So much of it is a blur. There are so few memories for me to look back on. Why would I wish to remember a time in my life when I was so unhappy? I felt unwanted, unloved, not good enough, unworthy for years. The rejection and abandonment of my first year left me both mentally and emotionally scarred. I didn't understand and didn't know how to deal with the feelings I couldn't even put a name to. Somewhere in there, when my parents moved to a new town, I changed my name from Jane to Sarah, which is why I started my story the way I did. Without realizing it, I created self-fulfilling prophecies in my life that relationships wouldn't last and anything, including jobs and marriages, would end. As important as my early life is to my story, after all, I wouldn't be who I am today and doing what I do without it. The wake up call brought light bulb moments that helped me find myself. In December 1996, I'm living in Northampton with my second husband, Kevin. I hate going to the dentist and yet here I am having to have a wisdom tooth out because of an abscess. Very ironic considering what happened next. The numbing injections, three of them, weren't fully working. I felt the dentist pulling and tugging on the tooth. I clenched my hands around the arms of the chair, grunting in pain. Crack, then another. Don't worry, that is normal, I was told. It didn't give up easily. It's finally out and now I can relax. Kevin took me home. I was in the bedroom when the pain started. Why is it hurting so much? So much pain. I was on my knees and put my face against the hot radiator, tears rolling down my cheeks. It got worse over the next few days. Something isn't right. I can barely open my mouth. I am struggling with chewing. I can't get my toothbrush between my teeth to clean them. Did my jaw move in a way it shouldn't? A week later, Kevin took me to the hospital. A very disbelieving triage nurse told me, dentists don't break jaws. You will have to wait and it could be up to four hours. Me, I'll wait. The doctor who saw me sent me for an x-ray. Please clamp your teeth around the mouthpiece and remain still. I can't open my mouth wide enough to do that. Do the best you can. While I waited for the results, the triage nurse came in. I don't remember the words she used, but now she believed me. My jaw was broken. At long last, someone listened and believed me. I was sent home for the night and asked to come back the following day for my jaw to be operated on. Back at the hospital, the operation took two hours as they tried to put my jaw back into place and insert pins to secure it. When I came round, the nurse told me, you became violent. It was only later that I realized there must have been a lot of pain. For many years, I was affected by period pains and lay in my bed, kicking my legs. 
I'm guessing I did the same as the anesthetic wore off. Or could this have harked back to when I was in pain at the age of one and the stored trauma in my body? My husband picked me up the next day, took me home, and I warm and warmed up some of my homemade soup for me. The following day, it became clear, purely by his attitude, that the caring stopped and I was expected to kin continue as if nothing happened. Six months of pain and sleepless nights followed with numerous painkillers and sleeping tablets that didn't work. I was exhausted, but eventually morphine broke the cycle of pain and spasms. At the same time, I worked full time, studied for accountancy exams, ran a home and still managed full time people pleasing. Something has to give. I stopped attending my course and started learning a little bit about homeopathy, including the benefits of Arnica and Ignatia to support me through the shock and trauma, not just of the broken jaw, but as it turned out, my childhood trauma as well. Then in October 1997, I broke up my marriage. We were together for 11 years, but only married for three and a half. I temporarily moved into the spare bedroom before moving into a rented house. At the same time, work told us the company was being taken over and we could either go to the new company in Bournemouth or take severance pay. Somehow, I saw this as a new beginning and a gift. In August 1998, I started my move to Bournemouth. I stayed with the company for the transition period to support the transfer of information from our systems to theirs. I bought my little house in February 1999 and took redundancy in April, walking straight into a new job within six days over the Easter period. Now I am free to discover who I am. I asked to see a psychotherapist to help me understand why I'd been the way I'd been. And it helped me to gain an insight into my story and the circumstances that contributed to it. I always knew what happened and the circumstances surrounding it. The, aware the awareness that not everything is in our control came much later, along with the understanding that my parents were affected by the rules of the hospital. I wasn't abandoned or rejected. It was circumstances. Sadly, however, that isn't how it felt to a one-year-old. A recent thought, is it the incident that causes the trauma or the feelings it activates in us? Especially if we felt we weren't listened to or believed, felt ignored, rejected, abandoned, filling us full of feelings of being unloved, unwanted, not good enough. It isn't necessarily the physicality of what happened that causes us the greatest pain. Especially if you've become a people pleaser, and I can speak from experience, we lose ourselves and who we are. We become who others tell us to be, to keep them happy. Sadly, we can become all too easily controlled. But it doesn't have to be this way. Are you ready to learn to say no to others and give yourself permission to find out who you are? Are you ready to let go of everything others have told you to be and explore yourself and the world, having new experiences regardless of what others may say? I did this. In February 2000, I joined a group from the Scientific Exploration Society which traveled to Romania to work with the Carpathian Large Carnivore Project, tracking wolves and lynx in the Carpathian Mountains. We were there for two weeks. Nobody knew me. I could be me. Before that, in 1999, I abseiled off the water tower in Pool to help raise money for a charity. In the old days, my mother's reaction would have stopped me. 
Over the next 20 years, I experienced many different things. I took myself to Egypt to see dolphins in the wild. And in 2005, took a small group of adults with learning difficulties to America, a project I called Spirit of Freedom, to spend time with the Nez Perce in Idaho. We also visited Yellowstone National Park. The practice, unearthing your true self. Do you know who you are? Would you like to discover the you buried beneath all you've been told you are by others? The suggestions and thoughts I share here are all things that have supported me in finding myself and being true to who I am. They are suggestions because it is important for you to find what works for you and what speaks to you to support you on your healing journey. Go at your own pace. Learn as much as you can about the circumstances of your early life, the highs and lows, the challenges and experiences. Reflect on the information, especially the lows, to come to understand them. You don't have to like them. Ask about the experiences your parents and grandparents went through growing up. Listen to their stories. Many indigenous peoples, Native Americans, the Aborigines, the Maori, all share their wisdom and history through storytelling. What we witness within our family home shapes us. In many cases, it forms how and who we become. Doing this can support the adult you with an understanding your younger you didn't have helping and supporting you when you connect with your younger self. Two, your first name, your given name, is very important and powerful, especially the name your mother called you as a young child. Start by speaking your name out loud to yourself. Repeat it over and over, gently and calmly. You're asking others, you're asking nothing of yourself, only acknowledging yourself, the whole of who you are, feel its resonance. By giving yourself the space to do this, you can then sit and feel any changes that start to occur within you. Your younger self will start to feel seen and you can always sit quietly and see if they will communicate with you. You can also tone your name. Some may call it singing, incorporating the energy of sound into the practice. The best way to do this is to break your name down into syllables. For example, How I came to understand the importance of our name. I was blessed to live close to some heathland and walked there regularly. I love being out in nature. One day I was talking to Jane. I can't remember what I was saying when suddenly the thought hit me. The only person who had ever rejected me was me when I changed my name from Jane to Sarah. I was christened Sarah Jane and now use my whole name to honour the whole of who I am. I understand that far too many of us don't like our names, probably because of the memories of being told off or always being asked to do something or not. But this little exercise can help you change that. 
When working with clients, I tone their name. The one their mother called them, it has a profound effect. Three, why am I worrying about what others think about me when they aren't? This thought came to me one day as I stood in the kitchen. It was as if a light bulb went on and a massive weight lifted off my shoulders. Especially for you people pleasers, constantly worrying about what others think of you. I hope it helps you in the same way it has me. What other people think and say about you is none of your business. The most destructive thing you would ever do is to believe someone else's opinion of you. You have to stop letting other people's opinions control you. Wayne Dyer. Four, affirmations. This is an affirmation I use every day and have for years, along with others. Please feel free to use it or reword it as it feels comfortable for you. As I acknowledge and release my past, old wounds heal at last. Now I live for today and know it is special in every way. I am special. I love me. My gift, a meditation, meet your younger self. At the foot of my bio, you will find a link to experience a meditation to meet your younger self. Suggestion. On the first listening, invite in a happy aspect of yourself, helping them to get to know you and feel comfortable and safe in your company. When you're ready, do the meditation again, this time inviting in any part of you that wishes to come forward helping and supporting your inner child, your younger self, to trust you. I'm sure that once you've done it a couple of times, you will be able to take yourself into meditation whenever you choose, and the connection, love and trust with all aspects of you will grow, building your confidence in who you are and your abilities. Whatever your story, if you would like support, find someone who will listen, someone you feel comfortable with. Our stories may not be the same, but many of us can relate to and empathize with the feelings they caused. There is a lovely line in a poem called Be Yourself by Bruce B. Wilmer. Wisdom lies in what you've learned and what you have withstood. Wow. <laughs> I don't know what to say, Sarah. Your story is, I mean, I, I am a, being a friend of yours and having had to, gotten to know you over the years, I'm very familiar with this story. And yet, as I hear you read it, I find my heart just melting. It's, I don't know, there's something about the way you share it, something in the way you use your voice. It just touches me very, very deeply. And uh, I'm so glad that you were able to take what happened in your early childhood and transform it into something so powerful for helping other people. That's a real, a real gift. Thank you. Thank you. And I hope you didn't mind the fact that I actually toned the suggestion no. of how to use your name because I thought I could try reading it. But actually, what I do, that's what I do. And I, just I thought, know, I know. By having that ability to, for people to actually hear it. Right. And of course, as soon as you toned my name, I started vibrating. <laughs> it's, it's powerful. It's powerful. And uh, yeah, I, I I don't know what to say. It, how was it? How did it feel for you to be able to share that story in this way? I'm always happy to share my story. Um, I really do in in any form. Um, 
And if it touches even only one life and helps them transform, that is the most important thing. What I find, what works for me is that my story now has no hold over me. I'm not saying that there are still layers of the onion that still need to be peeled back because things crop up from time to time. It's a journey. I refer to it as being a journey. It is a journey. Mm -hmm. um, and for all of us, it's start where you are. You will grow and the people will find you at the right time for them. And that's the important thing. So I'm really happy to share my story. I suppose I've given so many talks about it. You know, the fact that I was sat on the floor. My mother never put a tablecloth on that table for the very simple reason, having trained as a nurse, she knew what could happen. And this is where my understanding, if you like, is it was a gift I gave myself so that I can be here to do what I do. And therefore, I can't be in a place of that holding anything negativity over me. Right, right. Beautiful. And that's so true, isn't it? I mean, the journeys that we take are, well, they're unique to each of us, but they're all constructed in such a way as to help us come to understand and experience and express the fullness of who we really are. Of course, not everybody get, gets to the full expression of who they really are, partly because of you know other things that are going on, and they may not ever fall get free of this people pleaser or the the idea of you know worrying about other people's opinions. So it's it's beautiful that you you have shown a way for some people to find a way out of this circular loop that they're stuck in. So that they can become more liberated and begin to express and experience themselves more fully i i think it's beautiful no thank you and i and i really hope that it does touch life but correction no i know it will touch lives of course it's, yes it's just sort of and even if i never find out whose lives they are it doesn't matter it's just knowing that for every single one of us in this book that's right we yeah. have put out there what we were meant to put out there and that's the most important thing right well my friends there you have it another and absolutely fantastic piece of material an example of what's available in this book gifts of wisdom and if you haven't already purchased a copy or if you'd like to consider gifting one to your friends or your family or whatever please head over to our Amazon book page. And that link again is in, in the screen below. Also, if you'd like to connect with uh, Sarah Jane directly, please reach out to her on her website at https colon slash slash vocalreiki.com. That link is also on the screen. Thank you all for stopping by. I hope to see you again for the other videos in this series. Love, light, and blessings to you on your continuing journey. Bye-bye for now.